That might help. <laughs> so I don't have to strain to get it out there, right? Okay. Um, can everybody hear what I just said? We're okay. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, so the, the microbes are very important for making nutrients available to the plants so that it increases the nutrient value in the plants, the food that we eat. And so we're just focusing kind of on the, the microbes today. So something bad has happened to our food. So the, the, as I was saying, the food nutrient content has dropped greatly over the last 70 years. And actually, it was a problem even before that. It's just that these studies went back and looked at USDA databases. And they compared from back in the 1930s and 1940s up to like the present day. And they saw these huge drops. But even back in like 1930s, people were concerned about the lack of nutrient density. And a lot of doctors were saying, oh, you know, all my patients are having these nutrient density, or, or they're having nutrient um, uh, deficiencies. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, um, it has just gotten worse over time. So there, there have been changes in our food system and in our agricultural methods that have caused this. We now have depleted soils, depleted of what? Minerals, depleted of organic matter, depleted of good microbes. So, and we also have lots of what I call chemical sides. So fungicides, herbicides, insecticides. And the GMOs have just made things worse. Instead of going the other way, they have genetically modify something, so they can put more chemicals on. And those foods do have less nutrients too. So this is a really interesting chart. And it goes from about 1900 up to the present day. And it shows the, the drop of food nutrient density, like these different minerals dropping down. And that's come about a lot because of the mechanization of farming and adding chemicals of various types in GMOs with the glyph glyphosate, which is, uh, ties up nutrients. And then this chart is just an overlay of the first one, but it shows the um, people having all these different problems, like cancer and heart disease and things like that, and how that's increased. So decrease the minerals, increase the problems with health. So how do we increase food nutrient content? Um, I do soil analysis for farmers and gardeners, and I do a very extensive analysis with like 18 different minerals on there and the pH, and I'll show you more about that in a little bit. And of course, the microbes. Um, increasing the beneficial microbes, their diversity, and also the earthworms, making those nutrients available to the plants. And I do plant tissue testing. Um, so like a leaf tissue test, so we can see what's going on with that growing plant and what it needs. And then we can actually do foliar nutrition sprays. And that's very fast acting. Helps those plants um, with their, their overall health and increases the nutrient density of the food. And then I go the extra step and I look at the final food and actually look at its nutrient density, compare it to USDA values. And that's like something in my book that um, my research. So for my PhD, I actually looked all the way from soil through the plant tissue and into human blood to see the effects all the way, which is really unusual because m most universities just sort of pigeonhole everything. It's sort of like, oh, you look at the soil, Oh, you look at the plant tissue. Oh, you look at human health and, and human blood and such. And I said, no, I want to look at all the way. Let's see how it affects. Anyway, so the bottom line is that we want to give our plants the correct amounts of everything they need to express their full potentials. And then hopefully, when we eat that food, we can express our full potentials. So we're going to just really kind of focus in on the microbes, since that's what you know, Korean really brings about the microbes, and um, so this is what we're going to kind of focus on today here with this talk. Um, but we need lots of different kinds of bacteria and different kinds of fungi. 
um, see all these tens of thousands of species should be there. And as I said, they make the nutrients available to the plants. They also do suppressives, suppressing of diseases, and Ted was talking about some of that stuff. And um, you've heard also about the structuring of the soil, how they stop erosion. And some of them fix nitrogen from the air. And where do we get them? Compost, vermicompost, compost tea, inoculants of various types, including the IMOs. So I know some of this is a little redundant, but it's like maybe it'll sink in really well. <laughs> anyway, you can't manage what you don't measure. And so I took Elaine Ingham's course, and um, I bought the microscope that she recommended, and I do this work also. So I'll look at somebody's soil under the microscope and see you know, what sort of levels and activity of bacteria and also the levels of fungi that are there, and protozoa and nematodes too. Okay, so now this slide is just sort of showing like all these different elements that go into making some good food. And I think a lot of people sort of get pigeonholed in either, oh, it's all about the minerals. No, oh, it's all about the microbes. But I'm saying it's, a, it's about all of these things and the minerals are actually needed for the microbes to be healthy. You can kind of think of the microbes as little animals in the soil. So what do microbes need? Well, kind of like us, they need air and they need water and they need food and they need housing. So like Josiah was talking about the housing and the biochar, right? And you know, we're feeding them different things. So some of the things that they need are carbon and nitrogen. And depending on what kind of microbe they are, they like either more or less of the carbon and nitrogen. And we're gonna have a slide later that talks about that. And then looking at mineral elements, the calcium magnesium ratio is really important about the hardness of the soil. If you get too high of magnesium in comparison to calcium, you get very hard soil, a tight soil. And some say that this, is, this ratio is the most determining factor as to whether farmers are gonna make money or they're not gonna make money. So it's hugely important. And what I see, because I've done soil analysis all over the island, um, a lot of times the magnesium is much higher than it should be in relationship to the calcium. And so we do have hard soils. I can't hardly get my soil probe down into the soil sometimes because it's just so hard. And the sodium also hardens the soil. And I've seen that, especially if you're down near the ocean where you get those salt breezes that come through. Wow, it can be high in sodium and it's really hard. And you also have water absorption issues. So. I'm going to skip down to the next slide and then I'm gonna come back. I just wanted to talk about this ocean water because I know some people like to use ocean water and it's okay and it's good because it has lots and lots of different elements. But if, it's, if your plants need the elements that it's supplying, um, because it, it is really high in sodium. I mean, look at this, how much sodium it has compared to something like calcium. And in your soils, you're gonna need a lot more calcium than sodium. If you need sodium in your soils, that's great, you know? But you can also kill your plants by using too much of it. So that you have to be careful about that. And look at the chlorine, very, very high chlorine. You do need some chlorine, but you can also kill your plants if you put too much on there. Um, like chlorine typically is very hard on the microbes. <laughs> It can kill the microbes. And that's why in organic, like certified organic, you can't use things like potassium chloride. It's not allowed. And um, it's, it's hard on the soil. Now we're gonna go back to that other slide and we're gonna finish up. Um, phosphorus, uh, and this is like a soft rock phosphate. And Josiah was talking about this too, and it's, the fungi really love it. Uh, and there are different kinds of soft rock phosphate. Um, some of them, I, I like the one that comes from Florida, it's called Calphos. It seems to be cleaner than some of the ones that come up from like Idaho and Montana, which can have heavy metals. So you don't want that. And then down here is molybdenum and cobalt. And most people don't soil test for these. They're pretty unusual, but they're actually needed by the microbes. So molybdenum is needed for the nitrogen fixation by bacteria. And cobalt is the central ion in vitamin B12. If you don't have these things in your soil, then you're not gonna have the diversity of microbes. They're just not gonna be there because they need this and they can't live without it. 
So basically, you need to think of your, your microbes as little animals, and they need a large array of minerals. OK, so high quality analysis are the key. And oops, here we go. Um, there's lots of things that go into it. And I'm not going to go into each one of these, because it's just too much to go into. They gave me 10 minutes. <laughs> But there's lots of elements, and these are all on uh, my soil analysis. And then I do the microbial analysis also, and plant tissue analysis, as I said. And I, I interpret them for nutrient density, increasing the nutrient density in the foods. So that's the other thing. There's hardly been any research about increasing nutrient density. Most of the research is about yield, not about the food nutrient density. But um, I'm hoping to change that more and more. <laughs> anyway, um, so this is just an example of one of my tests that um, the soil report. It's uh, two pages, because I said it's got lots of things on it. And here is a chart that is going back to this um, fungi to bacteria ratio. And you can see here that different crops need different um, ratios of fungi to bacteria to work well. So the trees need a larger amount of fungi compared to bacteria in comparison to things like um, vegetables. So vegetables and row crops is more like one to one, whereas your fruit trees, you need um, like five parts of fungi to one part of bacteria or even more, depending on what it is. And the interesting thing about this is look at down here at the bottom, weeds, 0.1 to one which means there's a lot more bacteria compared to fungi. And what I see in soils when I do all these analyses is that I see most of the time we, we have bacteria but hardly any fungi. And no wonder they're having weeds, weeds, weeds. So by shifting that balance, you can change things. Okay, carbon to nitrogen ratios. Um, bacteria need a different amount than fungi, so the fungi need more carbon and less of the protein, whereas the bacteria need more protein. And this chart's and the other chart's in my book, too. So, Okay, so if you do things right, you are going to get increased nutrition. You're going to have better flavor, because the plant can express all of its flavor compounds and longer shelf life, and even um, changes in human blood glucose response, which is cool. Uh, this is one of my farmers. Um, and you're going to increase your quality, decrease pests, increase yield, and increase viability, like economic viability for the farmer. In summary, managing your microbes, you want to get a microbiological test with the microscope. You want to use um, comprehensive soil mineral analysis. And then, of course, you're going to amend and fertilize according to the test results. Here's my book, which I did bring some copies today here. And I'm happy to say that it's made number one in a couple of categories on Amazon. OK, well, good. Oh. Yeah, I recently heard about someone that was using lots of dolomite lime in their soil. And they actually put so much in their soil that they sent it that they had to sell it at farm. Wow. Yes, that, that, that is true, and, um, and that's one thing that people tend to buy products that aren't good for their soil because they didn't test and they didn't have someone tell them. And sometimes I'll send somebody their test results, and it says to use gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, and or lime, which is calcium carbonate, not dolomite, which has a lot of magnesium. It's like 20% calcium and 10% magnesium, which is a huge imbalance according to what you really need in the soil. And if you've already got too much magnesium and you put that on, you're going to have a real problem. And it happens. Mm -hmm. Epsom salt, that is high magnesium. It's magnesium sulfate. So, so, you know, I mean, some soils need magnesium. But what I see around here, most of them, it's more calcium they need, not magnesium. Uh, yeah, I was just curious if you mentioned uh, the seawater and the fermented seawater regarding the, the minerals in it. I don't have a date on that. That's interesting. Yeah, it would be interesting to see what's what. So, I mean, if it's basically seawater and they've just added microbes, I'm not sure. Yeah, they like to add 
Yeah, I don't know. Well, the thing is, I mean, you're still getting some salt water there, right? So, and, and often I actually recommend that on my tests is use ocean water, but you're going to have to dilute it a lot. And, you know, it's, it's whether you need it in your soil or not. That's the key. That's why we test. So we know exactly what to put on and balance our soil. And it's also balanced for the crop that you're growing. It's going to be different if you're growing fruit trees versus whether you want to pasture, for instance. Okay.